welcome to the Industry Angel Podcast. We hear from the best business minds across the globe, entrepreneurs, social influencers, marketing mavens, and sales rock stars. We've got them all. Here comes your weekly dose of inspiration with your host, Ian Farah. So welcome to the February 19 live edition of the Industry Angel Business Podcast. How many times have we done this now? <laughs> Today I'm joined by the CEO of Generator. Welcome to the Industry Angel, Jim Maudsley. Thank you. Jim, first time here at One Trinity Green? No, no, I've been before. Oh, right, okay. I've been to one of these talks before a oh, while ago. Right, yeah. On the right side of the tine? Uh, yeah, I yeah, suppose good so. Man, yeah, good yeah. man, good man. My wife would say so anyway, definitely. Oh, Gateshead lass? She's a Gateshead lass, yeah. yeah. yeah I've done my homework. <laughs> <laughs> Who's here for the first time? You're kind of a big deal, Jim. I'm, 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 I'm shocked, to be honest with you. <laughs> Thought he was going to come and see me, A, on a Tuesday night in February. There's and B, yeah. when Newcastle are playing at home, yeah. I know, so, yeah, 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 actually. Yeah. But I suppose we're on the wrong side of the town for that. We are indeed, we're red and white over here. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, you and I have never actually met. No. Nope. So, we'll have a nice, natural conversation. And this region's really small, so we're probably only, you know, six degrees of separation is probably like one, you yeah. know. Um, but when I think about you, Jim, I mean, I, I, I've heard of you, I know you, you're a big, tall, handsome dude with a brilliant beard. That's when I think, but I also think about music Yeah. when I hear about you. So if you don't mind, we'll start there Yeah. because we've got like 30 years to talk yeah. about. Yeah. So where Makes does this sound all... like a dinosaur? It, well, I was, I did, I did, I did, I wrote a piece recently and someone, the first line of it was like, I've had 30 years in the live music industry. Mm-hmm. And so I said, you don't want to say that, you sound like a dinosaur. So I just scrubbed it out and started again. You read my notes as well about being a dinosaur, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> so let's start there then. Where did that love of music come from? Well, the love, of mu- the love of music, the love of music, which also reminds me of a panel event where someone talked about the love of music and then some clown in the audience said, define love and wouldn't go like. But anyway, um, the love of music, the love of music is like where everyone love of music comes from, really. It's just, um, so when I was a kid, uh, I got into, I mean, it, it, I got into, I got into listening to music through friends, brothers, really. Um, I was about eight, and you know, I mean, I went to a talk by Mark Kermode the other week, and it was really interesting because he said that his favourite ever record was "Sugar Baby Love" by the Rubettes. Now I'm really showing my age, and that was the first single I ever bought. So I was like, oh well, that's really interesting. But I got into like rock music really age, really early, like. Uh, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Jimi Hendrix. I got really into that when I was about eight, (laughs) bizarrely enough, mainly through friends, brothers and stuff like that. By the time I was 11, I was going to gigs. Um, And I was always like, and and there was two things about gigs. I was like, I always wanted to be in a band, but I was pretty crap, do you know what I mean? I was a crap singer who uh, could never sing the way he wanted to. So I was in and out of a few bands. And when I started going to these gigs when I was really young, I was quite fascinated by... um, by uh, what was going on off stage, you know, how you put the get, because like going to a gig is like the theatre or whatever, you know, it's an illusion, isn't it? You know, you're just focused on the band, especially when you're young, you just think that the band, that's all it's about. It's all it's about is the band. You don't think about, you know, that you keep seeing, and I remember seeing these fellas that used to run on and off the stage with guitars and pull leads out the way and stuff like that. And I used to think, what, do those, what are those guys doing? What, what's, what's going on? So, From there, bizarrely enough, I got involved in this theatre group, but I got involved in the theatre group because they did sort of rock musicals. And the bit that I wanted to get involved with is with the PA and the lights and the stage sets and stuff like that. And then later on, after I realised, you know, I had no future in uh, being a singer, a rock singer or whatever it was, I decided when I was like 17, I think it was, 17, 16, 17, that I wanted to be a promoter. And all my mates laughed at me. They were all like, what's a promoter? What's a promoter to? And you've got no chance. So from there, just jumping ahead a bit, like, I then tried to find, uh, a, find, a, find a further educate a higher education establishment that would have me. And secondly, in somewhere where they had what I thought was a growing live music scene. So 
I used to read, read like the NME and the Melody Maker avidly, like you would do if you were into you know music at that level. And obviously by that time, my music, had, my musical tastes had, 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 had altered, changed. I still like rock music, but I was getting more into indie music. You know, it's like the Smiths were big at that sort of time. You know, um, I still cursed the day I gave away my seven-inch copy of This Charming Man <laughs> for some stupid reason, which was, there, was the Smiths' first Was there a woman involved? No, it wasn't that. Serious. I gave it to a pal of mine. I don't know why I gave it to him. I just I don't know. Anyway. Um, so I, I, so basically Newcastle, I sort of identified Newcastle as this sort of place that I wanted to come and see if I could eke out a career in live music. So that was the background. Really. So Newcastle University? No, Newcastle Poly. All right, okay. To do what then? Uh, to learn how to be a live music promoter. So no, what, what was the course? Do, I, did, <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did government and public policy, as it was called. Okay. Which... You know, it may sound a bit odd, but the thing was about it, it was, in politi- it was a politics thing, but it, it, it stood me in really good stead in the future. Uh, I didn't realise at the time. It was A, because when I was producing a live, large-scale live music events, it was inter- you, you knew your way around local government. And it stands me in good stead now because I always knew my way around local government. In terms of funding and putting Just things on? No, in terms of structure and how they work and what okay. makes them tick and where the interactions are and stuff like that. Do you know oh, what I mean? Okay. And, and how has that helped you in, in Newcastle is it in, in terms of putting events on? And how it yeah, nav- in terms how of putting events on, it's helped. Mm-hmm. I mean, where, it, where, it, where it's really helped is once you get established and you've done it for a long time, especially the event side, it, you know, you, you, start, you start talking, you, you obviously build relationships. You know, everything, ev- everything I've ever done is about relationships, do you know what I mean? And you start building relationships um, uh, first and foremost with, with, with key officers, and then obviously as the stuff that you're doing gets a bit more impactful, if you like, then the 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 the, the councillors start getting involved. But and then you start learning who's gonna be really helpful, who you can actually go to, you know, and actually have discussions and say, look, you know, and, and that they'll understand the impact of not doing something or doing something. So to illustrate that, I won't I'll uh, to illustrate that, a couple of friends of mine, one of them being my best friend. <clears throat> And the other one being a really close friend. It was funny, actually, one of them, they're, they're business partners now. One of them I ran Evolution Festival with, the other I ran Shindig with, if that means anything to anyone. And um, they, they, they're they in business now, and they, they were doing this really ambitious project, which, let's say, was moving a brewery to a park. Okay. And they had 108 objections, and not one councillor was supporting them. So they basically came to me and said, can you go and have a chat with some of the councillors that you know? And sort of tell them how progressive this is in your sort of usual gentle, persuasive <laughs> manner. So I did. I shouted Adam down the phone a bit. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting because one of them, he was a cabinet, I won't name names, but he was a cabinet member of Newcastle City Council. said, but I haven't had an email that says blah, 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 blah. So I was like, all right, cheers, thanks very much. And then just got on the phone to Dave and went, you need to write them an email that says blah, 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 blah. Right. And it worked. So it's about building relationships and understand you know because sometimes it's understanding who has got the influence and who hasn't and you know stuff like that and when you're trying to pull off things that are like large-scale projects you know particularly the music events that because you know we used to have this saying that i borrowed from uh, an old mate of mine george but he was said he, he described it as jazz he said like you know he basically said jazz it sounds like the martians are landing and they're putting up a shed <laughs> <laughs> and i always used to use that phrase like when we were building an event and people were like oh it's like you should sit there and meet with them going the martians aren't landing and putting up a shed you know we just put the gig on you know so so thinking about that mark on the city then what are you most proud of the kids <laughs> uh, professionally um so I'm really, I'm, you know, I'm proud of a lot of the things I've done. I'm really proud of Generator. That's been a big part of my life. I'm really proud of what we did with Evolution. I'm really proud of, you know, Shindig. They're the three key things, really. Do you know what I mean? Gener- and I, I'm really proud of Generator, the way we've, we've evolved it and the way we've changed it. And we've, you know, we've, and I'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but, you know, the way we've gone from music into digital and tech, you know. Do you want, do you want to tell us what Generator does and what it is? Yeah, so Generator is, Generator is, uh, Generator is, um, we, we, we now say that Generator is uh, an organisation that is creative digital business strategists. Um, so everything that we do is, is everything we do within Generator supports something or an ecosystem or um, in some ways now a movement, if you like. So basically Generator originally started as a music development agency. When I got involved in it, <clears throat> it was very much about supporting musicians and trying to find their pathways and identify how they could present themselves to the sort of the music industry, if you like. 
Uh, and then basically I was like, oh, that's very good, but what about the businesses? So we, we, we've got this whole side that, 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 that still develops talent. We still have a very, we have a very strong, highly recognised f- around the UK, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, talent development arm, you know, which, which, which we've developed artists that have reached major label status. At some point in their career, we've had, <clears throat> we've had, we worked with uh, Maximo Park very early on, really early on. Uh, showcased them in Manchester, where they met the management company. For example, Nadine Shah, who's from South Shields, who we've had worked with there. Bands from all over the country. We've recently had a lad from Walls End, who so far, since he recorded uh, some tracks with us, has grossed around 200 grand in revenues mm-hmm. from those recordings. So you know that's very active. And then the other side of it, what we did. So we went, well, you know, we went, and then with our business support, it was originally music, and then we went more and more into creative digital, and now we're edging more and more into tech. Um, and that again is around providing business support programs that look towards growing the businesses and helping businesses to grow. Uh, from you know a, a number of businesses, so we've so, for example, we'll have people in there who are like one or two people businesses, but then we've done a lot of work with teams at like Hedgehog Lab and and some of the businesses there, and some of the some of the teams at Atom Hawk, and certainly Orange Bus is another one we've done a lot of work with in their teams and stuff like that. So that's really interesting. And then the third part of what we do and how it links together is Digital Union, which is a membership organisation for creative digital and tech businesses. So it all sort of links together, but they're the three major parts of what we do. I mean, obviously, music's really passionate f- for you, and I can, I can, I'm sure we all can really hear that. A question that I've got is, what have we not done in this region that you would like to have seen from a music point of view, like an event? Probably, probably, you know, I mean, when we were doing Evolution, for example, people used to say, like, oh, but it's not a proper festival. And I, we used to say, well, it is a proper festival. It depends what you're defining. But I think probably the one thing that... The one thing that I would say in answer to that question is probably a proper, you know, sort of three-day greenfield site festival. Mm-hmm. And um, people have tried. I'll be quite blunt when I say couple of times clowns have appeared on the scene and okay. and 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 done things that have you know so basically if you get someone coming along and they say they're going to do this and they go out all guns blazing in the press and they book a few bands and stuff like that and they get a little bit of traction and then it all falls apart it takes about 5 years for an area to recover from that right especially where somewhere like the northeast because the northeast is um the northeast is is the northeast is a tough market mhm Partly because of the population size, you know what I mean? And partly because even though, you know, the North East, look, don't get me wrong, I've chosen to live here. I, I'm passionate about this region. Absolutely love it. It's been extremely kind to me and I absolutely love it. But you haven't got that critical mass. So, for example, you, you get you get a lot of bands that come in from America, say, and they'll go London, Birmingham, Glasgow, Manchester. You know, they'll do that spine. But Manchester's got, it's not just the fact that Manchester's bigger, it's got that sort of huge catchment area. It's 30 miles from Liverpool. It's, you know, how many miles? 40, 50 miles from Leeds, do you know what I mean? So it's got that big critical mass. And we're, we are a bit out there in terms of population size. So we miss out a lot of artists. And because of that, and because it's seen as, you know, it's, 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 it's quite a hard, hard ticket to sell. It's quite a hard place to sell tickets for a lot of artists, do you know what I mean? But I think because of that, I think the area has been ripe for a big Greenfield Festival and probably out of all the things that I've not done, and don't get me wrong, I have been down the avenue of working on one. You know, we even secured a couple of years ago, I was working with a couple of guys three years ago now and we secured half a million pound Mm -hmm. in investments to to get one on the go. But then someone, as I said before, this is probably why I'm quite bitter about it. Someone at the same time sort of came along and said, oh, I'm going to do one, I'm going to do one. They completely messed it up. All right. And then it was just it just made it extremely difficult for, for us to get our project off the ground. Might that project come back? No. Don't think well, probably I think if someone was to approach me and say, Do you want to get involved in this and help me do it? Do you know what I mean? I would do it. Yeah, definitely. But <laughs> in terms of me driving that project, probably not. Okay. We are live streaming over the internet, so you just put that out there. That's fine. Yeah, you're accountable now. If someone comes up and says, I've got a mill. That's fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, um, obviously, you must have been exposed to a lot of characters in your time. (laughs) (laughs) I thought we'd get asked this one. Okay, so who's the standout then? In terms of... A little bit crazy. Joey Ramone. 
Okay. Yeah. You can't just throw it out there without telling me why. Because he was just out. Because he was just out there. Do you know right, what I mean? Okay. He was just like difficult. To, oh uh, yeah, and Flavor Flav was another one. Right. He chased me down the corridor, screaming, "Have you got a can of Red Bull? Have you got a can of Red Bull? Have you got a can of Red Bull?" <laughs> and I turned around. And there's Flavor Flav. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> "And did you?" Yeah, I got one. Got him a can oh, of Red cool. Bull. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 cool. yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Joey Ramone, uh, Joey Ramone, Joey Ramone's one of me ones though because I played Space Invaders with him. But right. He didn't talk to me all the time. No, all the time we played. Now he was just. I think he was off his nut probably. Right, <laughs> Joey Ramone. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he won clearly then. Uh, yeah, well he won. I was no good at computer games. Right. So, uh -huh. Yeah. So let's flip that then. Who's super cool? Who did you really enjoy being around? Well, I used to. I used to. You know. I, I suppose basically the, the people I've enjoyed most time in, in my career in music is a lot of the DJs that we used to put on at Shindig and stuff. And some of them you actually sort of. And that was that was a bit better because you, you because you were because when you were doing when you were doing bands, so like you know I don't know what people know but bands come in they've got a tour manager you know they hardly talk to anyone da 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 da, da. it's difficult to sort of it's not difficult it's just it's sometimes you talk to them do you know what I mean. Um, sometimes, the, 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 sometimes it's like you know the, the, they put an aura around them, so you can't talk to them and stuff like that. But when you work with DJs, it's, you're very close up. Mm. You know, it's quite often that you'll pick them up from the airport or however they're travelling from the train station or whatever, and you'll talk around. You quite often take them for dinner and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? So you tend to. It was it was it was sort of easier if you like, and 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 just more relaxed and and um, easier to sort of. Sort of develop a relationship with 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 some DJs. So like I suppose back in those days, I knew Carl Cox quite well, mm -hmm. John Digweed, Pete Tong, got mm -hmm. on with him really well, and they'd come and play. They'd come up and play in Shindig in Newcastle. Do you know what I mean? And they'd always have time, and we'd do that. We'd hang out a bit. We'd go out for dinner and stuff like that. You know, and so that was good. That was that. I enjoyed that. You know, I enjoyed that sort of being able to have those sort of and you know if you bumped into them at another club they'd have time for you and right. you know you'd, you'd chat to them and stuff like that you sort of felt that you you were in a circle and you were part of that circle and and there wasn't even though you know you, you're still paying these guys bloody up to 20 grand you know mm. what i mean or whatever at the time it's more now in some of the cases you know you still had you still had that you could still have that direct relationship with them or you could still you know it was it was easy to get close to them and be close to them if that makes sense yeah sure you dropped a few names there <laughs> i thought if that's I, what you wanted me to well, do well that's cool yeah <laughs> drop 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 away but i mean that you thought there if we've got his phone who would be the most successful biggest artist that might be in your phone book right now i tend to have relationships more with industry figures okay so uh Record company executives, managers, mm -hmm. Text few them, DJs. <laughs> it's got the phone out. <laughs> so, what's interesting to me is I was thinking, are you an introvert or an extrovert then yourself? Probably on the spot now, aren't you? Yeah, I'm probably somewhere between like halfway and extrovert. Okay. Okay. I don't know, what do you think, Emma? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, really? <laughs> So th think across those sort of three decades in, in music then, what's kind of your biggest lesson that you've learned <laughs> across those years? <laughs> um, biggest lesson that I've learned? I mean, it's, it, uh, be trust, you know, but, but I always used to say that, actually, I always used to tra say this to promoters who used to come to me and ask for advice, and mm -hmm. the biggest lesson is trust your instinct. Okay. And would you say that across all business to us here? Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah, yeah, trust your instinct. I'm mean, usually, you know... It, it, on occasion when I've gone against my instinct, it's ended badly, you know, or it's not, it may not, you know, not in disaster, but it's not worked out, say. Mm. And I just uh, learned really, really early on, trust your instinct. Okay. <clears throat> so when you said they're not worked out, some of the things that you've discussed have been like big events with thousands of people there. Have you ever doubted yourself that it mightn't come off? Yeah, I've done, I've done small, yeah, uh, I've done smaller club nights where they were probably because they were more, to do with personal taste, you know, and you, you, you get involved mm -hmm. in doing them because you're really excited about doing them and what that yeah. means in terms of personal taste for music. But, you know, they're the ones that have always been the ones that haven't really come off, do you know what I mean? So, what, has it been a disaster or? I've never had any big disasters, no, right. I don't think. I don't think, no. Okay. But I suppose, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, other, the other phrase that springs to mind about promoting was one that, that me, me mate, Rob, who, um, who I did, did Shindig with, who now is 
um, he's just done that by the river project, Kate said, and and uh, yeah, I remember he he got me into what he was doing, which was shindig, because they needed they felt they wanted to grow it and they needed they felt they needed a professional professional promoter. I was like, <laughs> can't even say it, can you? <laughs> no, and. Uh, and uh, and it was interesting. After a while, he went, "Jim, this 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 promoting lark, it's up and down like a tap dancer's wig, isn't it?" <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a brilliant saying that I've used many times since. Um, but I mean, it's what one year we did we did evolution. I mean, the, one of the interesting things that people won't know is that one year we did evolution and we made a hell of a lot of money. And Dave and I sat there and said, "What should we do with this money?" And then, bizarrely enough for us too, we very sensibly said, "Let's just keep it in the bank." Yeah. And the following year, we we, we lost a load of money, but we had it. Right. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So it wasn't disaster. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So. Is that a bit of advice you, you just gave us there about kind of, you know, going with your gut and trusting the instinct sort of thing? Yeah. What was the best piece of advice that you've got, that you've had and you've took on board? Trust your instincts. No. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think, you know, it goes back to that. I suppose it goes back. I remember the early days, my first ever business, my first ever business um, was like a promotion business, which we had a little magazine and stuff like that. And a, a, an interesting piece of advice I got was 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 very much always like make sure that you're getting something out of it, you know. And that you know it was monetary, you know what I mean. It was like you know don't you know always make sure that you're getting something out of it. Always make sure that you you know. And I don't mean. You know, that can be perceived as like, oh, take loads and loads out of the business for yourself. But it was just always, just make sure you're always getting something reasonable out of the business for yourself, you know, while you can, you know. So at least, you know, if, if you look back and it doesn't work out, at least you've had something out of it financially. Yeah. I mean, most of the business I've been involved have had loads more out of than finance for obvious yeah. reasons. They've yeah, yeah of course. Quite exciting. Yeah, in, yeah, in definitely. In a lot of ways. So think about like us here and who, who we are influenced by you're quite unique, I'd say, in terms of your experience and your background. So who's been an influence on, on you? Well, several people over the years, you know, several people. I mean, one, I remember, so I basically, so, so as part of my early live music career, I was like the ENTS officer. So how I got into promoting was I was the ENTS officer at Newcastle Poly for two years. And I just thought, well, this is brilliant. I can, this is like an apprenticeship. Do you know what I mean? But within, very quickly, I was booking bands like the Ramones and the Damned and the Pixies and all these sort of bands that were around at the time. So it was like a bit of a baptism of fire, but I did quite well at it. Um, uh, and I remember at the time, just before that, though, around that time, there was also this thing going on. Because when I first, <clears throat> before I started that Ence Officer gig, I went to work in a pub called the Egypt Cottage on City Road. And that might mean something to some people, that might mean not, but the key to it was, it was next door to where they ran, where they filmed the tube. And it was the pub that was next door to um, where, they, where they then, after the, after the tube finished, they ran another music show called The Roxy, which at the time they were trying to sort of vibe for that top of the pops territory. And uh, the reason I went and got a job there is because all the record company executives used to come in there talking about their bands. Mm -hmm. So he used to get like, so he used to like hear about all these bands that they were investing loads of money in. So like I put Deacon Blue on for 60 people. Oh, yeah. And then people would be like, well, I'm putting them on. Like, you know, <laughs> later on, and people like, why are you putting them on? They're rubbish, do you know what I mean? And I'd just be like, well, just sell tickets. What are you on about? You know, it's all about, I remember going to this, 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 this chat once and the president of Live Nation Europe um, um, was doing this panel session and they opened it up to questions and this guy asked him a question that went on for about 10 minutes this question and at the end of it he said so what is your renewed strategy and he just turned around and said I'm a promoter I've only ever had one strategy sell tickets that's it mm -hmm. that's that's our strategy um but earlier on in that so I used to hang around with these guys who were like you know one of them was now is a massively successful live music agent I don't know where I've gone wrong massively successful live music agent tv producers all these sorts of people and I was like trying to get a job in London and they were like they were like why do you want to go and do that why don't you just carry on what you're doing carve out a niche for yourself up here you'll have a much better quality of life and I think that's the one key piece of advice that I was given when I was young that's born to be true do you know what I mean I think you can go and get lost in all of that I mean yeah you can make it but you can get lost in that London thing but to stay here and carve yourself a niche out and you know and do and, and have the freedom to flip and change and be agile you know about and fleet your foot about what you do has, has been very much something in my career um, so that was a really key early piece of advice stay here and carve yourself a niche so in terms of agility do you feel like you've got that now with generator yeah 
Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. you know we we tend to. Emma's probably. I'm not. I'm, not <laughs> and I'm looking at Emma now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the one thing about... I, I, I'll, I'll illustrate it another way. There was, there's a guy that um, is quite a well-known figure who's on our board now. Uh, and uh, and he's, he's, he's very well-known for being in the innovation space. And I heard him talk at an event, and then I heard him talk at a second event. I said, oh, I really like what this guy's saying, do you know what I mean? don't really understand what innovation means, but, you know, I, I really like what this guy's saying. So I approached him, I said, do you want to fancy having a cup of tea sometime or a bit of lunch or something and he said yeah yeah I'd really like to hear about what you do and I was like really so we went and sat down and he said just tell me about what you do and I told him about and at the end I told him how we made the journey and I told him about what we do and I told him how what we tend to do is go and listen we have a program yeah okay so we might have a European program but what we tend to do is then we go out and talk to businesses and go what's going to work for you you know, we're sort of like, you know, we're not just going to go right this, 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 and this, and then that's what you, you're doing. Do you know what I mean? It's very, it's very reactionary. And, um, and and the other thing that we've done is that we've kept quite a small team, and then we bring in people that are specialists to deliver the specialist support that we need to give to the businesses, rather than trying to work with a larger team of people and just going, oh, can you do that bit? Can you do that bit? If you know what I mean? So when I sat down with this guy, you know, I just basically told him all this and told him about all the different things we've done and how we changed and how we're quite sort of agile and flexible. And then I said to him, <clears throat> I said to him, does, does we just make it up as we go along, really? And he just went, and he just went, does it work? And he went, and I went, yeah, yeah, it works. He went, that's innovation, Jim. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> So you know, yes, we're still. I I think we're still. I like to think we're still very agile and fleet of foot, and yeah. we we can change quickly and mm. pivot. You know. So thinking about that chap that you mentioned there, then um, have you had a mentor across the years in your roles? Is that a thing? Yeah, they've sort of changed. Yeah, they've changed. I mean, I had you know, I had one guy that that I had one guy in particular that springs to mind who who was on our board uh, for a while. And he was a really, he was a really interesting. He was a really interesting guy because he was a guy called Tony Wadsworth, and um, he he was um, he just he he just finished his stint as the chief exec of EMI Records, um, and he was the reason I got him to be on the board was because he was he he'd, he'd been given this role as a visiting professor at Newcastle University, um, so I thought, ooh. You know, at the time, this is going back about nine or ten years. At the time, I thought it would be really good to have someone who's that well thought of in the music industry. You know, this is the guy that signed Robbie Williams and Blair and stuff like that, amongst many others, you know. And then um, I thought it would be really good, be really good to have someone of that stature in the music industry to sort of help us on our journey and be an ambassador for us and stuff. And he was fantastic. He was absolutely brilliant. But, you know, he, he used to... He, 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 I found out quite early on that he... Um, it was really, I, I was. I didn't realise he had such a close association to Newcastle. It turns out he had. He actually had friends that I knew. Do you know what I mean? Which was really bizarre and and stuff like that. And um, you know, one of the first things he ever said to me was, um, "Where's this fest?" Because we were doing the festival at the time. Where's this festival? And I went, "Oh, well, how well do you know Newcastle?" He went, "Probably better than you think." And I was like, "Well, do you know where the Free Trade Pub was?" And he went, "Yeah, yeah." He goes, "My best mate was P. Zorty. And I was like, "What?" And that's a guy who used to run the Free Trade years and years ago. You know, and then. Um, it was it was just it was just uh, really strange. but he was brilliant and he was he was a real he took a real interest in me which was great and he was a really good mentor and I learned I learned a lot off him about how to deal with people and how to move forward and you know the, you'd have like it would just be great and those, those sorts of people are, are absolutely essential I think I mean at the minute I'm looking for a couple of new mentors because I'm sort of and I've I've been talking to a few people about that mm-hmm. because I think we're going and you know we're now the business if you like the organisation's going off on a on a on a bit of a new road if you like we're trying to make sure that we 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 take some of the best bits of our offering and and commercialise them if you like do you know what I mean so that's that's a bit different but when but Tony was great but Tony would be like. You know, you'd have a real complex issue that you needed to deal with, say about an artist that we were dealing with or something, and he'd quite simplify it by going, well, you know, you're right, Jim, but do you really want to be recognised as the person who stood in some artist's way over the mm. a few quid? Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Just things like that were just really, really good. Mm-hmm. So have you took a mentee then and paid it back? No. Never been approached, no. Okay. Never been approached? No. Okay. Never been approached. Don't think I've ever... No. Oh! 
That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lie. Yeah, I do. Actually, I have done actually. I have done, and it's 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 quite an interesting story, funnily enough. Crack so on. so basically, we did this promoter development program in Cumbria along about 12, 13 years ago, and there was a couple of kids on it. One of them was seventeen. The first business. First piece of business advice he ever asked me for was like he said, to, oh, he said, to, uh, I booked this band, you know, and I've signed a contract, and I, I, I just don't want to do it anymore, and I just need to get out of it, and I'm going to lose all my money, and not that I've got any anyway, and stuff like that. How do I get out of it? And I went, How old are you? And he went to 17 and said, Just phone him up and tell him you're not of legal age to sign a contract, and it's worth nothing. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant but the thing I really liked about, <laughs> the thing I really liked about it is he had the bottle to do it yeah and he did it do you know what I mean anyway a couple of years later the guy the same lad well about a year later he was 18 and he rang me up and says oh, we're going to put um, me and Ben who was another guy on this scheme we're going to we're going to put a we're going to put a tent on a rugby field and we're going to have a festival <laughs> and all this do you know what I mean 500 people it's going to be brilliant and I was like oh yeah brilliant yeah good luck with that like just give us a shout if you need any help and like over the years as they built Kendall Calling. Okay. They they basically used to phone me all the time. And, and what was really nice was like, sometimes you do help a lot of people and we at Generate help a lot of people mm. and especially music artists. And they're like, they're a bit low to credit it. There's all that mystery around artists. We came from nowhere. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Really? And, and yeah, yeah. And stuff like that. And we didn't really have any help and all of that. There's, there's quite a lot of that, believe it or not. Um, which is why we changed the way we deal with artists, but that's another story. But um, <clears throat> it was just really good because, like, uh, like uh, 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 they sold, they ended up selling sixty percent of their company to Global Entertainment for a few million quid. Right. You know what I mean, yeah. And then they rang me up. This is one. This is the two <laughs> things. They rang me up and there, uh, <clears throat> and he says, uh, "Jim, he says, what do you think about this deal? Do you think we should take it?" And I says, "Are you going to end up with seven figures in your bank account by the time you've done the deal?" I probably shouldn't be saying this, but he went, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> I went, listen, mate, you're effing 28. You can do this twice over and still not be as old as me. <laughs> <laughs> do the deal. Yeah. Gift horses and mouths are involved in this one, mate. Do you know what I mean? Excellent. So they've done the deal and it's worked out, you know. Mm. They, they still very much run the, run the event. But, yeah, I suppose, so I mentored them over a period of, like, 10, 11 years. They still ring me now and again. And the other part of that was it was just really nice, going back to that referral thing, is that I read, I picked up an art, a magazine and there was an article about them. Right. And they said, you started really, really young. How did you get through the first three years? And they just turned around and said, oh, we had Jim Mortley on the end of a phone. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, and that was just really then. nice. Cool. So that was really nice. Yeah, that's good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Should have got the points off them, though, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah. There was one thing I picked up on there you, you said about commercialisation. Mm -hmm. And what immediately sprung to mind is, and I'm sure that a lot of kind of public sector funding's drying up now, is that something that's been a been a challenge for you guys where you've had to think okay we now need to commercialize the business because the funding's not coming through is that what you meant yeah, by that some funding's not come through but the, the, there is there has been yeah i mean it'll change it'll change with yeah i mean part of it's to do with brexit do you know what i mean part of it's to do with knowing that we won't have sorry part of it's to do but well knowing that we've like we've run our business support programs for like yeah. nine years or something now we've just gone into our fourth one each one's about three years long mm -hmm. and uh you know obviously they're european funded and the landscape's unsure you know we keep hearing i mean it's, you sit with civil servants now in meetings and they go, <laughs> shared prosperity fund. <laughs> I mean, it's not a replacement for European funding at all. <laughs> you know, because that's the one joke, because I think they think it will be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But obviously the politicians won't let them say that, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's partly it. It's <clears throat> partly it. It's mm -hmm. partly, you know, it, it, it's partly because it, it gives you, you know, it gives, us, gives you more freedom. It's partly because I think, I honestly think that there's a lot that we're doing in this region that has been free and, and the quality of it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, like DU socials, you know, the sort of quality of the speakers that we get for, for that in and stuff Thanks like very that. Much. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? So it's partly to do with like recognizing that, you know, we, we run, we, we run things of really, really high cost. So one, one of the things that we did is we just looked at the portfolio of what we did and thought, what are the really, really ones the, what are the, what are the things that we're doing that are in high demand and could we charge for those? Because yeah, yeah it's a business model and it, and it is, it's also partly because I want you know, I'd quite like to get away from it a, as much as possible, if you like. Just what, because, that reliance? Just A, the reliance and B, the restrictions. Okay. Do you know what I mean? And the amount of bloody paperwork you have to do, to be quite honest. With some of the funds, anyway. Yeah. No, We've got, we have got funders who are very... I wouldn't say they were laissez-faire, but they've been great over the years. And it's we, we, I wouldn't say we're in a continuum. Every three years we have to apply for the money. Mm. But, the, but, the, but, but the money has allowed us... has, has really helped... 
the, what we've become and as long as we're doing A, B, C and D, you know, they're quite happy with what we do with that money, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You said something earlier on about asking the membership what they wanted, then you've just yeah. said there, like, what do you are doing and putting, a, putting you know, events on and so what kind of things are they, what kind of people, what kind of things have people asked for? Well, I mean, it, <clears throat> across the, across the piece, um, I mean, it really, it, 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 it it varies really. I mean, I was with so for recently. I was with a business, and you know, they've they've grown into quite a size, and they've got like a head of talent development. They're not called HR managers; they're called people. People. One business we 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 met another chat with. I've got people, people, head of people, and stuff like that. It's quite interesting actually. Talent development. I think talent development is really interesting because I think more businesses should look at developing talent. Mm -hmm using what's out there through apprenticeships through you know through through the education system i think more businesses need to take responsibility of finding the avenues themselves rather than just like moaning about you know universities not churning out the right graduates do you know what i mean There's, you know the the businesses that are getting the talent development the talent are the ones that are going into the universities and and finding it so anyway back to it so basically they, they was chatting to them and they were like oh it'd be good to have a hr meetup and we thought we'd never thought about that before you know we just thought and it's something we're looking into now okay we're talking to some of the members about to see how much of an appetite there is because some of, i mean the most interesting thing about this sector for me one of the most interesting things about this sector for me is that when we took over digital union <clears throat> we had this data set from from Cato council that we took it over from and we looked through it and i one of the things that sprung to mind which is one of the things that helped shape what 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 we have as digital union was that a lot of the businesses were like this and this is only going back six or seven years we're like 20 and i'm going well i know they're 120 now you know head count mm -hmm. and what you what what you realize is that what we realize is that obviously this this sector has, has has grown astronomically very very quickly in a very short space of time you know so what we thought about digital union was that we need it needs we needs to be more of a representational and campaigning um, organization rather than just being a networking mm -hmm. so what we do is that we'll we'll so obviously we had the manifesto last year where we we had a big open space event we had about 100 businesses come to it we had loads of topic areas that we discussed and then we boiled it down into like a 12 point plan you know of what they want to do and a lot of a lot of what they want is around it's very much you know skills and people driven you know the biggest challenge i think the biggest challenge for nearly every business now is growing businesses, getting the right talent into the business. Um, so I think one of the, ch I think, so the, so the businesses are very concerned with talent, they're very concerned with, they're, very, they're quite concerned with how much attention they have. You know, they, what I mean, and what I mean by attention is just, it's part of it, 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 a lot of it is to do with the talent relationship because a lot of businesses don't shout about what they do because they're too busy doing what they do, you know, okay. so. You know, one of my favourite ones is like, you know, I've just moved to colour coats. <clears throat> so me and my wife were trying to get pop cards and stuff on the Metro. I'm sure our views have had this experience. And it's the worst website I've ever come across <laughs> in all my life. Trying to top up a pop card like, takes right. a fucking half a day. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I was having this rant and it's about businesses in the region. And I was like, you know what really annoys me about it? What really annoys me about it is the fact that the company that runs the Paris Metro and the Oyster Card system is based in Stockton. Do you know what I mean? And hardly anyone knows things like right, that, okay. you know? It's mm -hmm. like, what Zero Light are doing? I did a talk last year for a, I thought it was going to be about 30 kids and it turned into 400 kids. I was like, oh my God, I walked into this room and you're all there. And I just basically did it. I did some slides and I basically just talked about like, look, this company does this, this company does that, this company does that. Then put the names of the companies up. Has anyone heard of them? None of them, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, they've all got one thing in common. One of the companies was zero. Like one of the companies was Orange Bus and I was showing their stuff they do for Sahara Formula One. Well, obviously zero like what they do with Audi and et cetera. Uh, and the other company was Atom Hawk about what they do with their sort of you know the the, <clears throat> the the stuff they do for Marvel and Guardians of the Galaxy and various other things. And I just said these have all got one thing in common: if you stand on the Time Bridge with a strong arm and a golf ball and went one of three ways, you could probably hit their window. Right. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To illustrate that all these amazing <laughs> businesses are doing something. So it's basically it's the attention because they want people to know, they want young people to know, and they want people to know that these businesses are there and they're doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that that's a big one for them. And then, you know, we, we, we obviously want some smaller businesses want us want us to try and point them in the right direction to get to get work, to get business, to attract business. You know, so going to put you in a spot a little bit here. Then, so we've got businesses in the room who are doing some amazing stuff. What can they do to help shout about what they're doing and, and raise their profile? Then, 
I mean, the other, the other needs to, the, you know, I mean, there's a lot that can be done through engagement through social media, okay. as you know, which is one of the reasons why we're doing the DU socials. We, we believe a lot in that. We, we had a, so for example, for us, we had a marketing manager and she went somewhere else. Do you know what I mean? She went to another job and then we looked at it and thought, do we need a marketing manager or do we need someone who's going to lead on engagement okay. and, yeah. and drive engagement for the business? Do you know what I mean? Because we're very community based, if you like, we're not community based, community based, but you know. We think everything that we do involves a community, you know, whether it's we're supporting that community through Digital Union or the business support programmes or we're supporting the music community through some of the events that we do and yeah. developing talent. So we thought that's... So I think, you know, spending time on, 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 on your engagement, if, you've got, if you're a small business you've got someone in the office who's predisposed to social media, then I would use that. You, quite easy to build up followers quite quickly I think. Sorry you can see my, my laughing uh, how good are you on social media Jim? Absolutely <laughs> terrible <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, sitting in Jim's pendant box on LinkedIn where I've been there for a couple of weeks now it's like, terrible. Is he trying to tell us something or does he just not log in? People describe me as a social media voyeur. Right okay. I have a little look at it but hardly ever post anything <laughs> I've noticed. Yeah, yeah. Hard matter to do research on <laughs> So I think should we do this lightning round then? Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Paul, my friend, do you have the horn? How is? <laughs> <laughs> it never gets boring, does it, asking Paul about his horn? Never, ever gets boring. So, what we're going to do is, Paul's going to sound his horn, okay? 60 seconds. I'm going to ask you some questions that your colleagues have provided me. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. And after 60 seconds, Paul oh, will God. sound... Well, at least it'll be last 60 seconds, I suppose. You know what I mean? <laughs> Paul, it's on you, buddy. And say yes or no, OK? Which of these items would stay once pushed into your beard? A pencil? Yes. An Afro comb? Yes. A toothbrush? No. A small marsupial? Probably. <laughs> Charlie's trophy for coming second at go-kart? No chance. The office telephone receiver when you put someone on hold? Yes. OK. <laughs> What would you rather, Liverpool won the Premier League or Tippin Point became the biggest record label in the UK? <laughs> I'm looking at, at my old friend Colin there, who's also a big Liverpool sporter. Is um, he? Liverpool became, uh, I would have to say Tippin Point became the biggest record label. Well, Colin might like this one. Would you rather wear an Everton shirt to watch every match or a pink Kappa tracksuit to do the, every presentation and speech? Pink. <laughs> Pink Kappa tracksuit. Pink Kappa tracksuit will organise that. Who's your favourite recording artist? Oh, changes on a weekly basis. Okay. Who's the most annoying one you've ever met? Uh, ben Watt. Do you ben know who he is? No. Nah. Ben Watt was the singer and everything. He was the sort of he was one the other the other half to Tracy and everything but the girl. Right. And he's annoying. Yeah, yeah, because it was that classic it was that classic case where like I loved Absolutely loved everything but the girl, you know, being seen them at the Albert Hall yeah, and yeah. da 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 da. And he, 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 I don't know if you know, but he went from being a, a sort of indie artist to being a dance artist and a DJ. And he right. played Shindig, and I just went up to him and started going, like, you know, you know, really liked your music in the early days, not being like, you know, gushing yeah. or anything. And he's like, oh, yeah, or whatever. And I went, hey, mate, I'm effing paying you. Yeah. <laughs> Never met your I just idol. Eh? Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've met my idol, and he was, he was amazing. Who's that? Kenny. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Should we keep going? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay then. Would you rather drink Fosters for the rest of eternity or suffer an eternal round of ERDF funding? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a proper craft beer wanker. That's why that one's in there. Right. So I have to answer that. Get off the pot, man. You're always like, you, uh, come on. I suppose, a, yeah, drink Foster's. Drink probably. Foster's, okay. You heard it here. Would you rather do Land's End to John O'Groats on a fixed gear bike or run a month long Brexit explained workshop in Hartlepool? <laughs> do the ride. In Hartlepool. Do the ride. Do the ride? Yeah. Okay, no worries. What do you want your legacy to be? My legacy? I don't know. You know, this is the interesting thing. Just, I know it's not a very short answer, but. Honestly, um, I learned a, a very, really good lesson once a while ago, and it's basically like, you know, when I was overdoing it a bit and I was chatting to a friend of mine who is very level-headed and very introspective about himself, because he's had problems in the past, not that I've got any problems, like, but, you know, 
And he just basically said to me, you know, one day, Jim, it won't say here lies Jim Maudsley, da 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 and list all the things that have done. It'll just say here lies Jim Maudsley, great father to his kids and loving husband and stuff like that. And I honestly think that, you know, me kids being all right and sound and, 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 and happy in their lives will be, will be a good enough legacy for me. I'm sure a lot of us echo them thoughts. That was the questions done, but I've been inspired by Jill from episode 88, Jill from Software City. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if any, anyone can imagine the question she was asked. It was, snog, marry, kill? <laughs> Remember that question? <laughs> and it was really funny, so I'm going to throw that at you. And you get your own back. <laughs> the Emma's looking really nervous. <laughs> snog, marry, kill? What do I have to do? I've never done this before. All oh, right, okay, well, who would you snog at work? Oh, where? <laughs> <laughs> Mick. Yeah. Mick, right? <laughs> and then who would you marry and who would you kill? I would marry Emma. <laughs> right, okay, you had to get that one out. But then you'd kill her. And who are you going to kill? Who would you kill? Who would you kill? I've got to say someone. Yeah? Some days, Charlie. <laughs> right, okay. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Okay, there's going to be some questions here, Jim, I think. So should we take some from the floor? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good stuff. What we'll do then, if you pop your hand up, I will... Hang on, Lee's telling us to do something. Repeat the question, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Repeat the question back into here so our listeners at home can hear. All right, so if you've got a question... Nice and short, not too long or techy for us. So who's going to go first? That'll do me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yes, Carl. <laughs> What's your view nowadays on producers seemingly controlling the music industry? Uh, What's your view on producers controlling the music industry? I'm not sure that they do, really. I'm mm. thinking, say, say somebody like Calvin Harris, yeah. who seems to just be everywhere. Yeah, he's a nice bloke. I met him once. Um, <laughs> Calvin Harris, well, I think... I think, yeah, it, I would frame it a diff. I get, I get what you're saying, but I would frame it a different way. Um, what is annoying? Yes, I agree. What is annoying is that producers, songwriters are controlling the industry, but that's also symptomatic of, you know, this the whole way that major record labels want to manipulate artists. So basically, you know, they will go up. They will. I mean, this is obvious. They will go after good-looking boys or girls that can basically... And they're, they're good singers and they can dance and stuff like that, but they don't write their own music, you know. And the worst ever, ever, the worst ever time I've ever heard this was years ago. You probably remember, there was a programme called Pop Stars, and the final 50 were in an audience, and one of them stuck their hand up and said, is it true that I can earn more money if I write my own songs? And they said, no. And that is the biggest lie I've ever heard in my life. Do you know what I mean? Because basically, you know, you make money on publishing. It's the songwriters who make the money. It's, it's publishing... In, 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 you know, a lot of people go, oh, they make a fortune live, but a lot of people don't perform live. But if you can get, if you can write good songs and publish, and I've got a, a pal who, you know, was fortunate enough to write several global hits. Do you know what I mean? He was in, uh, in the Lighthouse family, you know. And, you know, he's, he's, he's a, he, I mean, they've gone years ago, but they were global hits and they get played on the radio all the time, loads of places. And every time it gets played on the radio, he'll, he, picks up, he picks up a royalty. Do you know what I mean? But he gets that because he's a songwriter. You know, it's more the it's more the publishing side. So yeah, I agree with that way that it's gone. You know, has has dominated the music industry, and it and, and it is, <clears throat> and it's a bit un, it's a bit unpalatable for for the likes of for me, who wants to see more great artists coming to the fore. Calvin Harris is all right though. He's a nice bloke. Calvin Harris used to a couple of mine ran a club in Carlisle and they had a guy from the borders who was the DJ and he used to bring his little nerdy mate with him all the time. You know where this is going. He used to bring his little nerdy mate with him all the time. He just used to stand at the DJ booth and like watch the records and listen to the music. And it's Calvin Harris. And apparently he did that for a couple of years and then he went on to the being this, you know, biggest... Calvin Harris is a good example because he's the biggest published. He earns more than anyone as a songwriter. Interesting fact for you there. Thank you very much. See you on the spot there, weren't you? And you came up with the goods. Yes, sir. How do you rate the scene in Newcastle for the venues, um, DJs, and actual bands themselves? Newcastle's got the Newcastle's got the widest and best range of venues in any provincial city in the country. Full stop. 
You know, you, you, you know, I mean, and, and you can talk about theatres. There's more theatres in Newcastle than there is in, say, Manchester. The, you know, you've got, you've got a really wide... I remember um, there's this thing... Well, we'll talk about this one first. There was this thing about... Um, there's, there's a movement in London that's to do with... Um, to do with it's, it's, it came from London mainly that, like, property developers were going in and then complaining about the noise and shutting venues down. Mm. And we had a guy up a few years ago called... Uh, Jeff Taylor, who runs the BPI, and um, he uh, he was asking me about this, and I said, "There's probably more music venues opened in Newcastle in the last two or three years than have closed down." Do you know what I mean? It's a really, really healthy scene here for that. There's not, you know, there's not hundreds, but the ones that are doing well are doing well. If that makes sense. Uh, despite what I said before about, you know, it's difficult to get bands to come and perform here. You know. And there's some really good, strong promoters doing a lot of good work. Um, DJs, there's uh, a couple of guys. One's called Patrick Topping, and the other one's called Richie Ahmed. Um, if that means anything to anyone, He's from Shields, is he? Well, you'll you will know that in the last five or six years they have gone from playing. Um, uh, one of them played at Digital, and the other one played. I'm trying to. Oh, it's, it's lost me. Used to be the stage door when I was a kid, if that means anything to anyone. Oh, anyway, you know, and they've gone on, they're, they're truly global superstar DJs now. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, in, in terms of that, and, you know, I think there's, I mean, like, as Charlie always, Charlie at work, who always reminds me, you know, there's a really good, solid sort of grime and hip hop scene emerging in this city. So I think, you know, it shows you that, that there are opportunities, you know. And, you know, some of the artists that we've mentioned before, I mean, you'd, I'm not a believer, you know, there used to be this thing where, oh, it's Sheffield's turn and there's loads of things happening here. When's it our turn? I'm not, I don't believe in that. I don't believe that that happens. And, you know, we've, we've got, we've had in the last 10 years some really, really great artists at different levels. Do you know what I mean? And the, obviously the latest one who's got the biggest chance is Sam Fender. Um, you know, and he, he, he again is another artist. He's just won the British, uh, the Critics' Choice at the Brit Awards. And, you know, again, in his early days, we helped him and we certainly helped develop his manager who also manages Ben Howard, who, and his managers from Time Out as well. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think there's pockets, but there's only pockets anywhere else, if that makes sense. I think it's quite healthy. I think the music scene in, in, in Newcastle in particular is, is, is very healthy. It's just attracting the bands to come and support. Yeah, but that's, that's about the ability to sell tickets, though, isn't it? And that's what I meant before so about the population the size. Way. Yeah, yeah. You know, that can be about the population. It's not an unwillingness of people to go out to gigs. It's just the fact that, you know, we may not have the critical mass of population to, to support that, you know. I mean, I think, you know, if we're going off on a slight tangent here, people were coming to me a year ago going, oh, we're building this 12,000 capacity arena in Gateshead. And I was like, is that wise? You know, there's a reason why the Leeds Arena and the Liverpool Arena are doing well, and that's because there's seven and 8,000 capacity. Do you know what I mean? So that they're selling out. And bands want to sell out. They don't want to go to an arena and sell 10,000 10, tickets and there being 2,000 spare. They'd rather go sell 7,000 tickets in the 7,000 capacity. That's how, they, that's, how they, they, that's how they see it. Sold out. Do you know what I mean? It's important. Sorry, long answer to it. Yes, Jane. Hello, Lauren from that. So you cast such a good life and place. Where do you take Mrs Maudsley for a good night? Where do you take Mrs. Maudsley for a good night out? I, th I thought this was going to be HR related because you mentioned HR before and you just... No? Okay. Got to be careful here, haven't I? You haven't met my wife. Is she watching? No, she won't be. Uh, oh, yeah, that's true. I'm, you might have done. You might have done. Um, where do I take Mrs. Maudsley for a good night out? Mrs. Maudsley likes dancing on tables and <laughs> getting quite raucous, do you know what I mean? No, she likes. No, she likes. You know, she likes. Um, she likes the town. She likes a nice bar. Do you know what I mean? Um, I try and drag her to all the places that I like, where I can get me nice, good beer. You know what I mean? Uh, but she doesn't. But she likes. You know, she likes. I'm trying to think where she goes. Really, where she goes with a friend? She goes when she goes out with her mum. She goes to places like the Black Garter and stuff like that. <laughs> it's like, what do you go there for? But they love it. Do you know what I mean? She's a great people watcher. My wife. Do you know what I mean? She likes going to all these funny places and just sitting in the corner with a glass of wine and watching. And then she has too many and starts dancing on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I was in the Black Garter, there was a guy sitting You've there. You've been in the Black Garter? I have been in the Black Garter. There was a guy sitting there, and next to him was a big sack of compost. <laughs> and I said, can you have your chase? He said, no. I'm using it. <laughs> okay. I can believe it. 
Anybody else? Question for Jim? Yes, Mark? If you had the opportunity to pitch to a TV company or a reality show at the North East, what would it be? Oh, God. If you had an opportunity to pitch a TV show about the North East, what would it be? A reality show. A reality show? Not that we need another one of those. <laughs> Do you know you, you must you know, you know about this, don't you? So basically, so basically, I don't know if I'm I'm I'm, I'm not going to answer the question. Well, I will answer the question, but I'm just it's really interesting because I did some work scoping some sites out for MTV once, and uh, there was one of the guys on it who was on the original production company for Geordie Shaw, you know, and he basically said the whole idea just started in a room going, how can we emulate something like that? Jersey Shore or something like that, and someone just went, Geordie Shore, let's do Geordie Shore. <laughs> and that's where it came from. It's just like that idea in a, in a room, do you know what I mean? And I think it's something like, someone told me it's like the biggest reality TV show in the world or something now, Geordie Shore. Like, um, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, do you know what I mean? Um, what would the reality TV show? I'd always, to be honest with you, it's probably a bit selfish, I'd always like to do something that was about the life of a band or something like that, you know? There's a, there's, it's, when years ago, not so much now, because the books are a bit dated now, but when people used to come and work with me, I was used to recommend two books, and one's called, one's called Powder, and it's written by a guy called Kevin Sampson. I don't know if you've ever come across that book. It's quite thick, and it's basically, it, it, it basically, it's, it's a story of a band who goes from being just a little band playing tiny little gigs to being, you know, multi-million selling. And the powder reference is quite obvious. You know, the singer just goes off the rails because he's taking too much powder. And, um, you know, that, 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 so I've, I've always been really interested in that development side. And I think that would make, I think that would make a real backstage fly on the wall sort of documentary about, say, a band from, from Newcastle sort of going through the, going through the paces and, and, and developing the career. I think that would really attract me, I think. Like the Great British Brew Off. The Great British Brew Off. <laughs> I'll leave that one to Dave. <laughs> I'll leave that one to me, mate, Dave. Uh, Jack, did you have one? Going through the social, particular underscore death. Uh, do you have any political ambitions? Do I have any political ambitions? Political ambitions. No. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, Deb. I'm only, I'm only <laughs> laughing because there was a couple of people who were trying to persuade me to stand for mayor the other week. I was like, you're kidding, aren't you? I'm, su I'm surprised I've gone this long with only... That was from Deb McGargle, by the way. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. No, Deb, I haven't. OK. Thanks for asking, though. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, Paul? What's your other book? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's an even better one. It's called Kill Your Friends. And it's, ba and, it's, and it's basically about an A and R guy who basically plots his way to, you know, he's basically ha it's, it's about his career in A and R and signing records. It was written by a guy who used to be an A and R guy. It's called Kill Your Friends. It's, Kill Your Friends is a brilliant book, absolutely brilliant book. And it, what was really good about it is it's so far fetched when you read it. But I know loads of people in the music industry bought multiple copies and gave them to their families and said, "This is what it's like." And it starts off with that thing of I can't, I, I'll probably paraphrase it, but there's a there's a William S. Thompson um, quote about the music industry, and it basically goes on about where pimps run free and devils and this, that, and the other, and good men die like dogs. And then at the end of the quote, he says, and then there's the unpleasant side. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it, you know, if you if you get under the skin of the music industry, it can be quite ruthless, really ruthless. And people do just climb over each other to find success, which is. Uh, do you have a question here. I just wanted to know, are you like, um, what's your company set up as? Is it a social That's a good, interesting question. We, we have, we have, we debate this ourselves. No, it's just a company limited by guarantee. But we just, we just, we've, we've got, um, I would like to, we've got, yeah, but we, everything, if we make a surplus, we just plow it back in. So how, how, you know, when you send some people on your board? Yeah. Is that just because you want them? Because you wouldn't need that if you were limited to company. Yeah, but everyone, everyone on my board, is on my board because they can help the company or help the direction of what we're doing. But they they do they are they are like they are all directors of the company. Right, so uh, do you do you own the company? No, I don't know who owns the company. It's a good question. Though. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of these, th you know what it is, you know, Generator's been going since 91, you know, it's been going for quite a long time. So, like, I think it's just, I think, I don't know, maybe Dave Cross does, maybe he's got all the shares stuck away somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I know Dave, and... Um... 
Tay's one of my board members who founded the organisation. He was one of the funders, but then I'm thinking, could he get all the funding? Is it like a social enterprise? So it is limited. No, it's, it's, we just set it up as a limited company, and to be honest with you, that way it's given us a lot of freedom to be able to do what we want to do. Do you know what I mean? We don't have to worry about any charitable governance or what happens with the profits because we're officially not for profit. But we do put it all back in, and we're fortunate in that years when we've made a surplus. So, and there's that whole thing about funded organisations that you might get, you might get like, you know, you might get 200k in March. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, the, it, it, by the definition of HMRC rules, that would look like a profit coming out of the, the end of the year, but that'll you'll get it in March because it'll be, be spent on a two-year programme. So we have to be sort of, quite often, we have to be sort of quite careful how we talk to HMRC. But it is always money that, that is, and if we do make a surplus, it goes back into the, goes back into the activity, goes back into just doing more support, really. OK, I've seen the pizzas arrive. Got one more question. Dennis... Uh, Jim, the digital creative tech sector is a growing sector, it's an exciting sector, um, uh, however in education lots of businesses say that we are, young people are not being prepared for the world of work. You've done a lot of work in education yourself, if it was down to you, what would you change about the education system? I think one of the challenges, in the, I was talking to someone in the education system about this the other day, I think one of the challenges in the education system, to be honest with you, is not how do you attract here's a question how do you attract so if you want so basically there's two sides so basically yeah we all talk about coding and i would talk about the, the the creative process is just as important you know because basically you know it, it's like this question i was having a chat with david dunn the other day who's the chief executive of sun and software city who i know you know dennis and uh, and basically it's like you know zero light are they a tech company or a creative company the creative company to me i think they're a creative company you know they're a creative digital company i would say rather than being a tech company even though a lot of what they do is quite deep tech, do you know what I mean? So it's like basically it's those two sides. So that's, that's one issue, do you know what I mean? For the, and, and it's not a fault of the education system. I think, yes, there needs to be more done to make sure that a lot of the, the, the sort of stuff that we need that's going to fill, feed the talent pipeline needs to be put into schools. But the big, biggest challenge for the education system, it's hard enough to get developers into the companies that are going around. I'm sure people who've got businesses near find it absolute nightmare getting good staff in. So how the hell are you going to get people to go into schools and teach it then? To a good quality? I think that's, a, that's one of the biggest challenges in all of this, in, in all of this, in this talent pipeline debate, if you like. I think that's that's possibly, for me, the biggest challenge. Do you know what I mean? Did I answer the question? I don't think I did, don't I? <laughs> OK, Jen, do you want to do the raffle later, or do you want to do it now? No, she's doing it now. She's coming with the bars. Uh-huh. Emma? <laughs> you can do that. This is a morning with Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Scott McGowan. <laughs> Commiseration, Scott. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it is transferable. Yeah, it is. <laughs> 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 I'm done. I'd just like to say thanks to Jim. I mean, that was really open and honest. I really enjoyed that. I'm sure you guys did as well. So thank you so much for Jim. Thank you. Pizza and beer, pizza and beer, thank you so much. <laughs>